A six part bonus series where we're talking about the hearing loss treatment journey coming up. This episode is sponsored by Natus, formerly Otometrics, the preferred diagnostic equipment supplier of the Dr. Cliff Show. Since the 1950s, Otometrics has been one of the most innovative manufacturers of hearing aid fitting equipment and diagnostic hearing and balance equipment in the industry. When it comes to testing and treating our patients, we only want to work with the best. This is why we use Natus in our clinic. Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Cliff Olson, doctor of audiology and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am here with my co-host. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Rachel Cook. I am also an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you so much for joining us for our six-part bonus series sponsored by Natus, covering the hearing loss treatment journey. So today, we're really gonna be taking you, I guess across this series, we're gonna be taking you beginning to end, showing you what to expect throughout this process and how best practices tie into this process as well. Today, we're gonna to be starting with the very beginning stages of a hearing evaluation. And that includes obtaining a very thorough case history, patient by patient, and examining the outer ear canal, since that's the very first place that sound has to travel through. Uh, believe me, you do not wanna miss the pictures and images that we have coming up today, videos as well. Uh, we're gonna be looking at all sorts of things that end up in ear canals or things that can happen in ear canals, so. If there's ever a show that you wanna stick around towards like three quarters of the way through, this is the show if you wanna see some crazy stuff. Most definitely, so make sure if you have haven't already, please like and subscribe so that you do not miss any of the episodes in this series. Awesome. All right. So let's go ahead and get right into it. So step one, when you go in and you actually, you know what, I'm going to schedule an appointment with an audiology clinic to see what's going on with my ears, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that could be, whether it's hearing loss, whether you're having other issues related to your ears and you just want to figure out what's going on. The first step, of course, you call and schedule an appointment. But once you go into their clinic, the first thing that they will sit you down and do is go over your case history. Right, so case history is really just getting as much background information on you as possible. And uh, we actually have a graphic here that's going to explain some of the questions that you can expect when a case history is being conducted on yourself. So over on the left-hand side, the first questions, obviously, if you've scheduled a hearing evaluation, then something is probably going on with your ears. So the first questions should really be directed towards, um, you know, Talk to me a little bit about what's going on. Do you feel like you have a better hearing ear? The hearing loss that you have developed, is it sudden? Is it gradual? Uh, talk to me about the difficulties that you're having because of this hearing loss, and have you ever worn any hearing aids? Absolutely, and then you start getting into the family history. So if you have family members who may have had hearing loss or some ear-related condition, that is very important for your audiologist to know because a lot of times that can work down genetically through to you. On top of that, tinnitus is a huge thing mm -hmm. with individuals who have hearing loss or any other ear-related condition. So if you have tinnitus, that's something you need to make sure that you mention, especially if tinnitus is in one ear only. In fact, if you're listening to this right now and you only have tinnitus in one ear, that's that ringing and buzzing sound that you may get. That is uh, can be an indication of a serious medical condition yep. going on. So you wanna make sure that you schedule and get in for an evaluation and go through this hearing loss treatment journey as well. And then of course, vertigo, so dizziness is on the list. So it, what a lot of people don't realize is that your hearing organ and your balance organs are actually connected together yep. in your inner ear. So sometimes when you have an issue with one, you have an issue with the other as well. That can shed a little bit more light for the audiologist as well. And then on top of that, noise exposure. So almost everybody has had some kind of noise exposure, but if it's been excessive for you, that is absolutely something that you wanna be discussing with your audiologist. And this is at any point in your life. I'd like to make that clarification as well that noise exposure history is not just um, it's not just the most immediate, you know, past few weeks, past few months. We're talking lifelong with that. So really go all the way back and think about the times that maybe you had gone shooting without hearing protection on or concert going and, and things like that. For sure. Now, in addition to that, there are several medical conditions that can, that are rather associated with hearing loss. 
And the list of those goes on and on and on and on and on. But some of those that we see primarily in clinic and some that really shock patients is diabetes. Diabetes is the first one that I think of. Um, diabetes definitely is highly, highly associated with hearing loss. And so if you have diabetes, it's important for your audiologist to know that because maybe they put you on a schedule where your hearing test or your hearing is evaluated more often or uh, monitored just with a closer eye um, because that that condition can most certainly be progressive. Uh, Kidney disease is another one that falls into that category Uh, and also cardiac conditions. So many, many patients take blood pressure medications, um, blood thinners, things like that. Anything to do with blood flow in the heart can impact your hearing as well. And if you have any history past or present of chemotherapy, uh, and that segues us right into our, our next topic here, which is ototoxic medications. And so many, many chemotherapeutic drugs that are used to treat um, cancer also can impact the hearing organ. And that's very important to discuss with the audiologist as well, because when they're going through all of this, they're like, you know what, actually we need to do repeated hearing tests on you, serial Mm -hmm. audiograms to identify if those chemotherapeutic drugs, if you're actively going through chemotherapy, is having a negative impact. And that might even be the reason why you actually decided to go in and see an audiologist in the first place. But there's other ones that people don't even think about. So loop diuretics, um, uh, NSAIDs, so uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, inflammatories, those things can cause hearing loss and tinnitus as well. So any type of drug that you are taking, it's always good to hand over your list of drugs to your audiologist so they can see are any of these ototoxic to you. Yeah, high level antibiotics as well is a, is a really big one too. Um, and so just just make sure that if you have any of these medical conditions or if you regularly or have in the past taken high dosages of these medications, that's going to be very pertinent to uh, your your own personal case history. And a lot of that will kind of set up the process that your provider will go through and the things that they ultimately want to discuss with you as well. So being as open and honest with them as humanly possible at this particular stage of doing the case history is very important if you wanna make sure that you're getting a high level of care administered to you as well. But after a hearing care professional kind of digs these pieces of information out of you, because if they're doing their job well and following best practices, it's very important to not just make it incumbent on you to share this information, but also uh, they should be the ones pulling it out of you to some degree as well. But just be prepared that they're going to be asking a lot of questions related to these particular topics. But once they get done with that, then they're going to start rolling right into the evaluation process with you. And the first part of your ear that they're going to want to evaluate is the outer ear. And we actually have a nice little ear model here up on our table that I can kind of run through with you as well. So right here, what everyone thinks of as the ear, that is actually what we call the pinna. So that is the first portion of the outer ear. And then as that goes down into the ear canal, the ear canal is also a portion of your outer ear, and it goes all the way to the eardrum uh, portion of your outer ear as well. Now, when you start looking at what's the goal of the outer ear, it's you wanna make sure that you can funnel sound. I mean, when you look at this, it almost kind of looks like a funnel where it will trap sound and funnel it down into your ear canal so that vibration of sound can vibrate your eardrum. Right. And on top of that, when you have two ears that work together, you actually get timing differences of when sound hits one ear to when it hits the other ear, and that can help you localize which direction sound is coming from. And the pinna also helps you do that as well. It identifies not just in your horizontal plane, but your vertical plane as well. So when we're doing an evaluation of the outer ear, we have to make sure that there's no visible deformity Mm -hmm. of the ear at that particular point. And then on top of that, we want to make sure that the ear canal is uh, not having any blockages or anything like that inside of there because the ear canal actually has a resonance. And I want to bring up on the screen right now a resonance curve to kind of explain what we're talking about here. So what people don't realize is that when sound enters into your ear canal, your ear canal actually enhances that sound for you. And then it takes all of these additional effects of the ear canal, the pinna, and a variety of different aspects related to your ear and creates a resonance where it actually peaks sound at a particular frequency range. And the fun thing about this ear canal resonance as we look at it right now, is that is in the prime range of getting clarity out of human speech. Mm -hmm. So having an ear and ear canal that is not obstructed is very, very important. And there's a certain thing that we do to make sure that that's the case. 
Correct. So uh, this leads us into the, the first step of every single hearing evaluation, which begins with otoscopy. Now that word is kind of strange, uh, but it begins with oto, which is the Latin root for ear. And um, otoscopy is really where we are looking and evaluating this outer ear canal to see is there an obstruction or is there a pathology? Because this is the very first place that that sound is traveling through. So if there's an issue in the outer ear, it's like we can't even proceed with the next steps. Until do not pass go. Do not pass go. We've got to ensure that that the outer ear canal is looking and doing what it's supposed to be doing. So through otoscopy and nearly everybody has had their ears looked in at one point or another when they've gone to the doctor uh, in otoscope. A traditional otoscopy, you see this video of Dr. Olson doing this in the clinic. Uh, it's just a small kind of uh, magnifying glass type of a situation with a light on the end where you're able to look into the ear canal and visualize the ear canal and the eardrum. However, there are some drawbacks to this type of approach. So first and foremost, uh, you end up with a pretty limited view, right? So if you saw in that video, he's got to get all the way up to the ear there. You got to close one eye if, if you can uh, and, and really kind of look and what you're looking in at is this teeny tiny little circle and kind of moving it around to visualize all of the features of the ear canal. Um, but not only that, not only is there a limited frame of view, the next time that you see that patient, if you were to, you know, send them off and say, you know, go see an ENT and come back and let's look at this again, you have to recall from memory what that ear canal looked like beforehand. Yeah, and that's virtually impossible. I mean, when you see as many patients as you would typically see as an audiologist, you're not going to remember a particular ear canal unless you saw something funky. And again, yeah. We're going to show you some pictures of some funky stuff that later are. on in the yeah. show, so make sure that you stick around for that. But we actually use something called the Natus Otocam 300. This is a particular type of otoscope that we can do a variety of different things with that provides us with more additional value. So that's what it looks like on the desk. This is what it looks like when you're actually utilizing it. So the nice thing about this is, is that we actually get a nice full view of the ear canal and it's blown up on the screen for us. Right. But that's not the only a beneficial thing. The thing that I love about it is that we literally orient it to where our patients are facing the computer screen that we are showing their ear on. And I don't know if I've ever had a patient that they weren't like, wow, that's really cool yeah. that I get to see my own ear. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, this is great. And here's an example of it right here yeah. where we're actually showing that video to a would-be patient inside of our clinic and to let them know, okay, yeah, see here, there's your eardrum. It looks nice and healthy. Yep. And the other thing here is that once we get in there, we can actually, the push buttons on it allow us to take a snapshot of the ear canal that we can save for future use. You referenced yourself that one of the biggest issues is that they can't see it, but we have no way to remember yeah. what their ear canal looked like. Yeah. If you take an average clinic day, we are probably looking at between 10 and 20 ears, right? And then if, if, if you don't see that patient again for another month or so, by that point, we've seen hundreds of ear canals. So um, not, not being able to kind of compare a, a pre and a post type of image was previously a huge drawback of traditional otoscopy that has now been remedied by the use of video otoscopy and being able to take photos. For um, sure, and we can send those photos to whoever we want to. Sometimes mm -hmm. patients want their own photos, and sometimes we're referring that patient to an ear, nose, and throat physician, mm -hmm. and the ear, nose, and throat physician would be benefited from having, okay, what did that ear canal look like last week when they were in your clinic? Right. And there might be some change that happened inside of that window. So the ability to take a snapshot of that and send it off to another professional is extremely beneficial. And then one of the outside of the box things that I like to do with the Otocam 300 is actually look at really small components of hearing aids. So of course we're an audiology clinic, we treat a lot of patients inside of our clinic with hearing aids. Sometimes they can't visually see something like a wax trap or a wax filter inside of their hearing aid that is blocked with earwax. Yeah. And so you can take that camera and actually shine it on the tip of their hearing aid and, and blow it up for them and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much wax was actually inside of that wax trap. Yeah, there's a ton of uses for it and I, that's just such a great way to use it because we we often work with patients that do have vision concerns. So uh, not doesn't only work for ear canals, it also works for our hearing aid counseling too. Absolutely. Now we promised you guys that we would show you some images inside of an ear canal and we're gonna start off playing nice. 
with you guys, yes. okay? But then we're not gonna play nice. We're gonna show you some stuff that you need to see because you need to see the stuff that we see all the time in the clinic. And um, I think that this is gonna be eye-opening for in individuals out there uh, and why it's so important and interesting to be able to look inside of your own ear canal using the Otocam 300. So uh, like I said, let's play nice. Let's show them a normal ear canal right. with a normal eardrum. Yeah. So what are we looking at right now? So what we're looking at right now, uh, I would say that otoscope is pretty far into the canal. And what we're really visualizing in the center there, you can kind of see the ring around the perimeter. That is your eardrum, also referred to as your tympanic membrane. And when we look at the eardrum, what we want to see is a certain level of um, clear clearness yeah like translucent yeah, yeah translucence yeah. to it thank you uh and also we see a little bit of a flashback you can see on that kind of bottom left hand side of the eardrum a little bit we see the light reflecting there generally that's really indicative of a healthy tympanic membrane uh we also see going from top down to the middle there that's actually one of the middle ear bones that's behind the eardrum that attaches to the eardrum um, but overall when you look around things look healthy, they look clean, um, no glaring issues or concerns there. Very normal, very healthy ear canal and eardrum. Absolutely. Uh, no earwax from what I can see yeah. at all. Uh, you have the little blood vessels that are in there. That is totally normal to see. But if I looked inside of an ear canal like that, I'd be like, okay, your outer ear is looking fantastic. Yeah. I have absolutely no issues with this. I can move you down to the next portion of the testing. Right. But Oftentimes, that is not what we see. And so, listen here, if you guys are eating something right now, maybe put down what you're eating for just a minute. Uh, we're gonna go through all of these now, but let's take a look at some impacted earwax. Yeah, so sometimes we can get a pretty good buildup of earwax, and you will oftentimes hear audiologists refer to earwax as cerumen. That is the medical term for it. However, uh, Earwax is very important to the health and, and the vitality of the, the ear canal. And in small amounts and in small doses, it helps to push dead skin cells and thing, uh, things like that out of the ear canal and out of the ear. It's, it's doing what it needs to be doing. However, some people produce much more earwax than other individuals and it starts to kind of pile up on itself. And then we end up in a situation like you see on the screen where that earwax over time has just piled up, piled up, piled up to the point now where it is completely impacted. And when we say impacted, it means that it is blocking the entire ear canal and we cannot visualize the eardrum. And that is acting just like an earplug. Absolutely, you get a 30 decibel flat hearing loss with that. When I say flat hearing loss, I mean low, mid, and high frequencies, literally like someone put an earplug inside of your ears. And you could see the dark color to it as well. That is a telltale sign that that has been building in there for a while, a while and it is becoming dehydrated yeah. inside of there. And sometimes when it becomes dehydrated like that, it actually adheres to the canal wall. So then when you go try to remove it, um, that is an unpleasant experience. So oftentimes we'll have to place eardrops inside of an ear canal like mm -hmm. that. And then once it's softened up the earwax enough, we can go in and usually flush it out or pick it out if we have to. Right, and like you said, a 30 dB flat loss. Can you imagine if you jumped straight into a hearing test without identifying if that wax was there? Uh, if you do not identify that that wax is there, you're gonna do the test and you're gonna go, oh my gosh, you've got this hearing loss, right? Uh, no, it's only because you've got the wax in there, pull that wax out. You may still have some hearing loss after the fact, um, but at least then at that point, it is the true hearing loss. It's not the hearing loss that's being created by this obstruction. And I think that that's a very key point. So if a hearing care professional is following best practices, they are not skipping this step because you didn't report any potential issues with earwax or any other foreign object inside of your ear. This is a, uh, you should not ever go into an audiology clinic for any appointment almost and not have them at least look inside of your ear just in case. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you have wax that's built up like this, you should have a recurring appointment with your hearing care professional to make sure that that wax is pulled out. Because I can tell you, it is much easier to stay on top of earwax removal than it is to go and be reactive 
that plug could be an inch long uh -huh. inside of their ear. It could take six or eight or 10 attempts at softening the wax before you can actually get that plug out of the ear. And that can become very raw and just uncomfortable inside of an ear canal. And heaven forbid you are, uh, during the case history, that we identified that you're on blood thinners mm -hmm. because that makes the situation even a little bit more dangerous to pull out. And you have to be much more precautious as the hearing care professional. Right, so I think from a patient perspective, the ability to actually visualize that on the screen is huge because it's one thing for someone to look in your ears and go oh gosh you've got a ton of wax in there and we need to get that out right but for them being able to use looking at their own ear canal looking at that wax buildup in there it really kind of seals the deal of okay yeah I do need to be on a on a wax removal schedule with my audiologist for sure but you know things can get worse things can get worse. And so this is, uh, this might be your favorite one right here, because this was your patient, right? This was my patient, and this was also the very first time that I took a picture using the Otocam. Um, and so once I found out that I could use the Otocam, I had to use it for this patient because what can often happen in the outer ear canal, and if you're lucky enough to have never experienced one of these, good for you, um, but you can get infections in your outer ear canal. And this patient in particular had a, a pretty gnarly infection. Um, I think we've got a picture of it coming up here in a moment. Yeah, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so patient comes in and he says, listen, my ear canal is itching like crazy. I am this close to just scratching it with tweezers and a pencil. I need you to look in there for me. He also said on top of that, I can't really hear that well out of that ear and I'm just, I'm getting, it's driving me nuts. Um, Obviously, we both took a look in the ear canal together, and this is what we saw. And if you will refer back to the you know previous normal uh, otoscopy, this does not look very normal. So anytime we look in the ear canal, we can see some pink tissue, maybe a little bit of red tissue, maybe a little bit of like, you know what, yeah, just like that, beautiful, right? We should not be seeing green. We should not be seeing blue. We should not be seeing bright yellow. That is all very, very telltale signs of an active outer ear infection. And that's something that we have to refer out. We need to get that individual to see a medical doctor mm -hmm. to get treatment for that. Yeah. And the thing that I love about being able to show this to a patient is that it makes it real for them. Yes. Sometimes you tell patients like, listen, you gotta go see the doctor. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, like I don't like doctors, so I'm not really gonna go. Uh, but when you show them that, they're like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna go schedule right now to go see the doctor. And they also will not be sticking anything in their ear to itch it because they're like, oh, well, you know, if you didn't show that to them, they may be like, okay, well, I need to go see the doctor. But in the interim, I'm just gonna use a bobby pin yep. and go into my own ear and scratch it. You know, what's so funny that, that you just said that is that this patient, I started with traditional otoscopy and I looked in there and I immediately went, you gotta see this. So I switched it out, grabbed the Otocam, right? And I had said, you have got a pretty nasty infection in your ear. And he said, really, are you sure, are you sure? I said, you'll be sure here in a second. Uh, <laughs> take a look with your own eyes here. And then I showed him that and, and oh, the deal was sealed. He immediately was like, I gotta go get this taken care of today. And I said, yeah. And I emailed him pictures of the ear canal as well because uh, he said sometimes it is difficult to get into like his primary care, but that if we could send photos, potentially they'd be able to prescribe something, you know, before being seen in person. So. You know, and when you start looking at when we had the pandemic and all of that, you know, things like that is helpful too, because, uh, you know, telehealth, teleaudiology, all of that is becoming more common yep. out there. And so having ways to digitally and virtually send information, pictures, video even, uh, can be extremely beneficial. I mean, I don't think I have a single video where I'm looking inside of an ear canal in any of my videos that I'm not using the Otocam yeah. 300 to show that illustration for people so they can tangibly understand what's going on inside of an ear. For sure, it's just too impactful. And I think that it really contextualizes the conversation and it really involves the patient in the experience as well. For sure, for sure. It actually, it makes us better providers. I think you so, know, it, yeah. it, it makes it so you don't have to, and some providers are better than others with being able to articulate exactly what they're seeing and the magnitude of what they're looking at and how it affects a patient. So sometimes, you know, a picture, what do they say? A picture's worth a thousand mm -hmm, words, mm -hmm. right? There you go, and that is exactly the reason why you wanna show it. And, that, and then you get situations where you just wanna show them something cool inside of their ears. Yeah. So what do we got next? 
Oh, well, I don't know if I would consider this cool if it was in my own ear, um, but sometimes things end up in ear canals that shouldn't be there. Uh, and this can be true with beads and rocks with small children, right? Um, but also there are some creepy crawlies that can find their way into ear canals. And so what we're seeing here this would be an ant that decided to make this ear canal its home. And uh, I don't know, if someone ever looked in my ear and said, you have an ant in your ear, I think my first thought would be, you've gotta be seeing something else, Yes. right? Like, I don't have an ant in my Clearly, ear. Clearly, I do not have um, an ant in my yeah, ear. Yeah, it's gotta be a little piece of wax or something, like, no way. Uh, this takes away all questions of what exactly is in your ear. That can only be an ant. Absolutely. And you do, in fact, have an ant in your ear. Um, and then, you know, if you were being seen at our clinic, we would get that removed for you. Absolutely. Course. should remove that. But not without taking a picture first. Not without yeah. taking a picture. That would be sacrilegious for Definitely. sure. Right. Um, you know, when you look at something like that, you know, ants, I don't know how long they live for, but that ant had been hanging out in there for quite a while yeah. to the point where he thought it was so nice in there that he decided to die in there yeah. as well. Yeah. So that, I don't know, weeks potentially that that ant was just in there and then he died and then he was preserved in there fairly well. Could have been years yeah. that that thing is living in there. Yeah. Or dead inside of there. I, and I just want to say too, I spared everyone the photos of spiders and cockroaches in ear canals, but that most certainly can happen. Uh, the pictures are disturbing, so I, I didn't want to make anything too crazy on here. I thought an ant was a little bit better to visualize it, but a ton of different things can end up in your canals. Yeah, just so you guys know, I was trying to get the picture of the cockroaches on there and we could not Couldn't come to an it. agreement Couldn't on that. Couldn't do it. So then we have some more of the more, instead of strange things like that, we have more, uh, I would say common things, but more, more medical related yeah. things. And so yeah. we actually have a video that we can show up here with a patent eustachian tube. And so what we mean by that is that this individual's eustachian tube does not close when they breathe. So you can actually see movement of the eardrum while they're breathing. Yep. And you know, it's very uncomfortable, honestly. I've had a patent eustachian tube before where I was actually in a triathlon race, I got super dehydrated and my eustachian tube would not close. So I could literally feel the movement of my eardrum with every breath that I took and it just about drove me crazy. Yeah, oh, how could it not, right? And and what's so interesting, like when you do video otoscopy like this, you know, when I am looking at that, I'm like, oh my gosh, you've got to see this. And I move the screen around and the patient's like, whoa, what is going on? Um, and so it just, it really makes the entire experience so much more real for the patient. I, most of the time we're showing them a very normal ear canal. Right. However, there are moments like this, in particular, this patient actually had sent a Q-tip through his eardrum. And this was in the earlier stages of the eardrum healing up from that as well. So we kind of had dual conditions going on there. Um, but this really served to prove how just how thin the eardrum was because it was in those early healing stages from that injury just made it a lot more real for the patient of this is why we don't stick q-tips in our ears you know yeah and if so. you want to see the acute phase of that that's what our next image is of yes. so we have a perforation and perforations can be caused by a variety of different things but you can see that hole right there that could have been something that was created with using a bobby pin or a q-tip inside of your ear canal and that's why every audiologist on the planet will tell you never to stick anything bigger than your elbow or sorry smaller than your elbow inside of your ear canal because there really is not that much of a distance i know on my ear model that i have here on the desk it looks like that is a huge distance that has to be covered there but this is like seven times the actual size of an actual ear canal and so when you start looking at you're looking around 25 millimeters or yeah. so before you start running the risk of and it's different for everybody like some people have shorter ear canals too you cannot trust that you will not hit your eardrum with a q-tip so just keep the q-tips out of your ears keep the q-tips out of there i have several patients I seriously like five um, who have sustained some sort of Q-tip injuries one way or another, uh, just getting kind of like spooked when they were using a Q-tip. Uh, I had one guy whose 
dog jumped on the back of his leg as he was using one and so that sensation scared him he didn't know what it was that sent him kind of uh, freaking out a little bit and that just sent the q-tip straight straight on through you know and i've had patients just like you've had who've denied that they've used q-tips uh-huh, uh-huh. and so what's the best way to prove someone wrong and catch them red-handed well you take a look in their ear and you show them that you can see the cotton fibers yeah. that are left over inside of their ear canal like I said, catch them red-handed. Right. And then from that point on, they're like, I can't get away with anything. And then they keep the Q-tips out of their ears, right? Right, right. Now, generally, perforations of the eardrum are uh, acquired conditions, right? So either you get it, it's a trauma from a Q-tip, or you get in a car accident, or you've had some sort of ear infection, middle ear infection that has grown to a point where it has actually burst your eardrum from there. Um, And if that is the case, if you continue to get these repeated, consistent middle ear infections, oftentimes ear, nose, and throat physicians will place PE tubes, uh, which stands for pressure equalization tubes. These are perforations that are put into the eardrum on purpose. So these are intentional holes, and these help when the eustachian tube, which supplies air and equalizes pressure to the middle ear space when that eustachian tube is not doing exactly what it needs to be doing and there's fluid in the middle ear space that cannot drain on its own sometimes we have to go in there and we have to manually insert a pressure pressure equalization tube so that that fluid that's behind the eardrum can drain out a different way. And then it can actually have time to heal. Now you typically think of tubes in ears as being something that is happening with children. Mm -hmm. Uh, We deal with adults and oftentimes we have adults that have the same issues with either repeated middle ear infections or pressure equalization issues to the point where it's causing so much, so many issues in their life that they have to go in and actually have a pressure equalization tube. But you know, one thing that is nice to look at is that usually they never know what their pressure equalization tube looks like yeah. inside of their ear. And so again, it's it's almost like a party trick where you can, it's like, hey, I'm gonna show you something really cool. And then it becomes tangible and real to them. Mm-hmm. And I'm a huge advocate. I think that you know following best practices and doing things like this is very critical, but doing it in a person-centered care way. And what I mean by that is that you're actually including the patient in on this treatment journey that you're taking them through. You're not just saying, okay, I've seen what I need to see, let's move you on to the next phase of testing. Like you include them inside of that journey and it becomes more real to them and then they can be better advocates for themselves Mm -hmm. because what if they learn something about their ear by doing this that helps them better articulate something with us when they come back into the office? Like, hey, remember when you showed me what my ear looked like that last time? My ear is starting to feel exactly what it felt like when it looked like that. So can you, I need a skeletal appointment to come in. Yeah, yeah. It's just a way to really make it so much more real for patients and I've seen it myself, right? Because when I go to do otoscopy and I'm just looking myself, it's just such a boring process, right? I look in and it either looks normal or it looks abnormal and I'm going to explain it from there. Being able to involve the patient in that process is just fun. It's a fun way, I think, to start a hearing evaluation is this moment of like, okay, let's take a look in your ears. You know, what does it look like in there? And the patient doesn't know. It's probably the first time they've ever seen in their own ears. And it's just kind of a cool moment. How dare you have fun at your job? I know. We need to work harder, not have more fun inside of the clinic. You know, I think that's a huge goal that, that we focus on with treatment at our clinic too, is just having these really strong relationships with our patients. And this is just one of the ways that allows us to strengthen that relationship and bring them in on the diagnosis process and the assessment process as well. You know, I've only had a handful of patients who did not want to look inside of their ears because they get a little queasy with it, and that's totally fine. So if if you don't want to see inside of your ears, just kindly tell your hearing care professional, I understand you have the ability to show me. I just don't want to see it because, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, lose my lunch here in the office, which has happened to me before, not from this. That was totally my fault. We'll get into that on a future episode, trust me. Um, But let's go ahead and recap for everyone what we talked about today. Most definitely. So again, going back to the very, very beginning when we're talking about case history here, the main goal of case history is to really gather information about your health and your hearing. This is a very individualized process. This is your health care. This also helps us in determining the correct treatment plan down the road and ending up with this really individualized care, individualized treatment plan. So case history, first step 
very, very, very important. And then we need to get into otoscopy because after the case history, we really have to evaluate the, all the structures of the outer ear and identify if there's any deformities there or if there's any obstructions that would prevent sound from making it to the eardrum and then make sure the eardrum is in good condition from what we can actually assess visually. And if we do that and do it the right way, either we're able to move through to the next phase of treatment inside of the clinic or we have to refer them out to receive treatment from a ear, nose, and throat physician or otologist to clear up whatever medical condition we identify inside of their outer ear. Right. Now, at the end of the day, when it comes to either traditional otoscopy versus being able to do video otoscopy, hands down, I'm going to pick the Otocam 300 every single time. The comparison between visits is huge. Being able to determine the previous status of their ear canal versus where they're at today, that it's just, it cannot be beat. Um, being able to take those pictures and supplying them to other medical professionals, in some instances, especially in the telehealth space, that this can having that picture can save you a trip to do an in-person visit with a provider because you're able to supply them immediately with what your ear canal looks like, right? And so for an outer ear infection, if they were gonna look in there and say, ooh, you need some antibiotics, they can look in there and look in there from afar. And then finally, you can see in your own ear, which is pretty cool. Absolutely, and sometimes they even show them my ear as a reference point mm. for, you know, it, unless I have an issue with my ear at the time, yeah. but you have a reference point that you can show them or, or you can bring something up on the screen, something that you took a photo of before on a different patient to give them an example. So, you know, as long as everything is being done following best practices, you're gonna have a great onset of this treatment journey that you are on at this point with us right now. Now, if you guys are just joining us here or joining us a little bit late, just know that this is a six part series that we are going into. The series portion that we were covering today is episode one of this series, where we're talking about the outer ear, including the case history and otoscopy, uh, specifically using the Otocam 300. But next week, we will be talking about the middle ear, talking about tympanometry and acoustic reflexes using our Madsen Zodiac tympanometer. So you guys do not want to miss that episode next week. But if you are wanting to see this series with us here coming up in the future, make sure that you are liking these videos. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel with notifications turned on so you get a notification every single time we post one of these new videos. If you wanna catch our live show, you can catch them on Wednesday, but make sure that you join us every single week for this special bonus series where we're talking about the patient hearing loss treatment journey, and we'll see you next week.